Welcome to New Jersey Politics with Laura Jones. I am Laura Jones. And today we speak with one of North Jersey's most prominent elected officials, State Senator Anthony Bucco. Bucco, a Republican, has been leading the charge against vaccine mandates and wants the people of the state to have a say in what's happening in Trenton. First, we meet the man who has taken over one of the most powerful positions in state government, New Jersey's Senate president. Senator Nick Scatari was elected by his peers in the state Senate to take on the role. The position became vacant after the former Senate president, Steve Sweeney, lost in a stunning upset last November against a newcomer to politics. Good to have you here. Great to be here. Thank you for having me. Well, your predecessor, Steve Sweeney, he was president of the Senate pretty much as long as you've been a member of the Senate. So how's it going? How, how's the office? Have you moved yet? It's pretty nice. I haven't decorated yet, though. Ha having, a, having a little fun there about, about changing, changing the office. But, you know, in looking at your political path, you have been in the right place at the right time with the right skill set, uh, some would say. So can you fill the viewers in on a little bit about your journey? Because people know the name St Senate President Steve Sweeney. They're, they're not as familiar with Sk Senator Scudari. Well, I, I was born and raised in Linden, New Jersey. I still live here, uh, not far from where I grew up. I, I started my political career after law school. I ran for the Linden Board of Education in 1994, spent three years there. And after that, I spent seven and a half years on the Union County Freeholder Board. I was chairman of the Freeholder Board at one point in time. Uh, and then in 2003, I had the fortune of running for New Jersey State Senate for the 22nd Legislative District. And for the past 12 years, I served as the Senate Judiciary Committee, which I find to be the one of the most important committees that we have in vetting judges that uh, sit on our superior courts, as well as all the other courts in New Jersey. So uh, it's it's been a while, but I've I've really enjoyed it. Yeah. So so close to 19 years. So you've you've watched uh, you've watched the leadership. You you've been a member of the Senate. Now that you are there, and now that you have that gavel, um, what do you want to focus on? You wonder some of your priorities now that you are the Senate president. Well, I think a couple of the things that we've already started working on is the affordability to live in the state of New Jersey, property tax relief, uh, cost relief, uh, making things more affordable for the people of the state of New Jersey. Secondly, I'd like to slow down the legislative process. I think that we do a lot of great things, but people either don't know about it uh, or we rush things. Uh, we'd like to take more time with the important pieces of legislature, uh, le uh, legislative items that we work on, and we've already begun that process. Okay, so some people might say, wait a minute, you want to slow down state government. Doesn't it already go slow enough? So what, what kind of things are you talking about that you want to slow down? Uh, we don't want to slow down state government. That's not what we want. We want to slow down the lawmaking process, the making of laws that are going to be with us probably for the rest of our lifetimes. They deserve a full vetting and, and public view of what we're actually doing and give the members a full chance to work on these bills because there's lots of good ideas. And we want to have all of those ideas entered into the conversation through the committee process. Uh, and we, when we pass lots and lots of bills, and a lot of them are really good stuff, uh, people don't even know about them. They don't even know some of the laws. Give people the opportunity to absorb what we're doing, and then they can focus on uh, whether it's good, bad, or otherwise. And I, I generally think it's pretty good. So in, in your process of trying to slow down, I know Republicans have said that they want hearings, especially when it comes to COVID and the governor's powers. They think the governor overstepped his executive powers. Um, so is, do you agree with that? And is that what you're talking about? Allow hearings into everything from policies on, on health, how we keep people safe during the pandemic to uh, what other legislation you may be uh, talking about moving forward? Well, here's where I agree on the Republicans, and it wasn't necessarily talking about that particular issue, is that, you know, committee hearings and, uh, and, and the public's input and their input into the, into the committee process where bills are heard and vetted before they move on to a secondary vote, uh, they need to have more input, they need to, and we all need to have more uh, time to absorb the, the legislation, because some of these bills are hundreds of pages long and to give people just a little bit of time to read those and then the stakeholders to come in and testify to them. It's a very good process, but we wanna make sure that it's, it's all encompassing so people have an opportunity to give us their ideas. And sometimes we change things as a result of input from other parties because they've got good ideas. I've never said that I've cornered the market on good ideas. We wanna hear from other people so we can have the very best piece of legislation at the end of the day. 
Or when people are not talking about the pandemic, I think the biggest issue in New Jersey is talking about the cost of living and the affordability. So can you talk a little bit about what you'd like to see? It's, it's a perennial issue. You know, we always talk about how do we make it more affordable. So can you talk about what you'd like to see? It's a new year, new leader. What are you thinking? I think that's absolutely true. We're working on that's the first thing that we did yesterday's first hearing uh, of our new Senate session was concentrated on affordability and we passed several bills that really are going to have a real impact on people's lives, the real property tax assistance. Uh, and uh, several of those bills passed out unanimously uh, with Democratic and Republican support. And so, yeah, that's one of the topics of the day. And that's the one we're going to continue to hire for on. Make government run better, make it run more efficiently, make it run more cost effectively and give people tax relief. So those are the things we want to accomplish. Now, how do you anticipate working with, with your colleagues and also working across uh, across the hall with the assembly and, the, and then with the governor? You know, this last election, Republicans did make gains um, and Murphy, uh, Governor Murphy barely won. Um, so, you know, when you talk about, about the getting work done in Trenton, um, how do you anticipate those relationships to be? You know, we, we, we have some very spirited personalities in Trenton and uh, it can get, uh, talk about political theater, it can get very exciting um, and then, then work isn't able to get done because people are, are grandstanding and they're talking about um, themselves as opposed to the work of the people. Well, I think Trenton is in a better place than, say, Washington, D.C. We've got really outstanding leaders on, on both sides of the aisle. I'm looking forward to working with my Republican counterpart, Senator Oroho. We've got a great relationship that we've kicked off. I've been always friendly with the Speaker of the Assembly, Craig Coughlin, is a gentleman that I knew before we were both in the legislature as, as lawyers, uh, young lawyers back in the day. And uh, he's, he's a real gentleman. And uh, I said this before, it's hard to not like Bill Murphy. Uh, he's a very likable guy. And I think that uh, one of the things that I can bring help uh, forward is to try to bring all these groups together so we can make it about the people and not about the personalities. And you're not going to see that coming from me. I'm more about getting things done than I am about grabbing headlines. And uh, I, I think that we're going to try to move in that direction. I think we'll be able to work across the party lines and work in a bipartisan manner where we can. And I think that we, I think there are good, good ideas everywhere. Right. Well, um, Aside from, from cost of living, uh, people have to be able to drive and get to work in New Jersey and our roads and bridges they need. There's so much that, that, that they need. Um, and, and we hear a lot about you know, what is or is not coming from the federal government. So what can you say about New Jersey's infrastructure? Because we have the Transportation Trust Fund. Is it not uh, bankrupt again? Um, it always seems to be the case. So what, what about our, our roads and how does that rank on the you know, list of priorities and things to address? Well, transportation is always a top priority, making sure that people have the opportunity to get to work in, in, a, in an efficient manner and the trains run on time and the roads are safe for usage. And we're looking forward to seeing what we get out of the DC money that, that, that we're planning on coming our way for pandemic relief and, and other emergency funding and putting that to, to work immediately. I, I think we've been seeing gradual improvements in our roadways and our trains and uh, we're moving in the right direction, but there's certainly still a lot to do. It's winter. We're still in the middle of a pandemic. How positive do you feel that you will be able to carry on with the with the other business and to be able to live with the winter, with, live with the pandemic and continue, you know, to get these other projects done, which, you know, for the past two years, everything has felt like it's been on hold. Uh, everybody's lives have, have felt like they've been on I, hold and, and they're ready. You know, despite what's going on, a lot of people are like, OK, we, we, we need to see some action, you know. How likely do you think that is going to be? And in what kind of time frame? I think it's very likely. I, I believe, and this is just anecdotally, that the pandemic, the worst is behind us. We're moving in the right direction. New Jersey is one of the top vaccinated states in the country. We're seeing lower hospitalizations and lower transmissions now. Even with this highly uh, transmissive variant of Omicron, it, it hasn't, it hasn't de deemed to be as uh, lethal to people that are fully vaccinated and boosted. And I can encourage people to continue to do that. And uh, because that's the way out of this, the less transmissibility, the less uh, that it's going to mutate. And I believe that we're, we're moving in the right direction and government is going to continue. The state legislature and particularly the Senate has been in person uh, for as long as I can remember, we were down for not very long. We, we, we're in person, we're having in-person committee meetings, we're having in-person 
uh, uh, voting sessions, and, and we're going to get the people's business done regardless. Now's the time people need government more than ever, and we're going to make sure that we we do the, the jobs that they put us there for. All right. Well, Senator, we thank you so much for taking the time to talk to us, and uh, congratulations on becoming uh, Senate President, and we hope that you come back again. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Joining me now is Senator Anthony Bucco. Senator, so good to see you. Great to see you. Well, let's start with the governor's ma vaccine mandate. We've seen vaccine mandates shot down recently in the Supreme Court, specifically President Biden's mandate for private companies. Now, Governor Murphy, he does not seem to be backing away from mandates recently telling healthcare workers that you've got to get vaccinated or lose your job. So What's your take here and what are Republicans taking, if any, action uh, around health care vaccine mandates? Well, I think it's a big mistake uh, on the governor's part. And it certainly doesn't um, relate to the science because we know for a fact that being vaccinated is not preventing folks um, from becoming infected uh, with the virus. So... Um, you know, to take away that testing option just doesn't make a lot of sense because if you're tested, that's the only sure way to know um, that, that you don't have the virus at the time you enter a facility or go to work or go back to school. So I, I, think, I think that's a big mistake on his part. I think actually he's putting more people at risk because uh, folks are feeling comfortable simply by being vaccinated and uh, it's just not it's just not working and 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 the science has proved that right, it's so, an interesting point about about feeling safe um, and I want to follow up on that first though if people say you know what no I'm not going to and they decide to leave their job or lose their jobs due to the mandates well how do you see the needs of the healthcare system how, how does it impact on the needs of the healthcare system? I've already spoken to many of those folks, uh, many of the providers that run group homes and uh, long-term care facilities, they're already short staffed with skilled workers uh, before this mandate took place. So they're very concerned. Uh, you know, they're, they're seeing uh, and predicting that if this continues, uh, their facilities could end up failing. So, you know, one of the things I said was, uh, you know, what's the plan? If you're going to go down this road, Governor, what is the plan to backfill some of these agencies if, in fact, they start losing skilled workers and they can't get enough people uh, to man the facilities? What are we going to do to protect the most vulnerable? And again, if you don't want to get vaccinated, that should be your right. But allowing them to test and go to work, in my opinion, is better than telling people to be vaccinated and then not worry about it and go to work because we've seen firsthand that people that are vaccinated are coming down with the virus and they're infecting other people. So he let's said, let's no. try to err on the safest side. And that's got to be tested. Oh, you said that you've asked the governor, you know, what's his plan? What was his answer? We haven't heard. We haven't, we haven't, heard. Heard. We haven't heard. Because there is certainly yeah. a shortage of workers, not just in the healthcare system, all over. And you walk in a lot of, uh, of city areas and you see people have not renewed their leases. Um, if you go to the doctor, you don't always get to see a doctor. Sometimes you see a, a nurse or, uh, you know, or, or you are doing telehealth, um, which is it's great that you have the op option to do telehealth. But I mean, there, there is a, a real crisis uh, even before this, just, you know, due to a, a, a worker shortage. So uh, what, what do you think can and, and should be done? Well, I think, first of all, we, we, we need to reach out to the people that are on the ground that are fighting this virus at a, on a daily basis. We need to reach out to the folks that are running our hospitals, running our facilities, running the group homes, and get input from them before we make decisions that in, impact their ability to continue to protect those that have been entrusted to them. I don't think that's happening. And, and that's a shame. I mean, a lot of times Trenton uh, makes a decision or, or sets a policy without talking to the people that are gonna be impacted by it. We gotta get away from that, especially during this crisis, because uh, 
you know, those are the folks that know best how to run their facility, how to keep people safe. And, um, and we need to get their input before we make these drastic decisions. Well, how would you do that? Through a series of hearings? Because I've heard from some of your colleagues that, hey, we would like to have uh, hearings and give the people, the public, a chance to give input as opposed to people just showing up at school board meetings where that uh, often goes south quite quickly. Our Republican caucus has asked for the hearings. We've asked for subpoena power. We want to delve into this issue. And unfortunately, our colleagues on the other side of the aisle um, just haven't seemed uh, to want to go down that road. And it's a shame because, uh, you know, transparency is a great thing. And the knowledge that's out there should be tapped into. And we should be able to talk to these folks and find out from them firsthand what they think the answer is. And, and I, think, I think one of the things we have to look at is um, the salaries that these folks are being paid. You know, um, they can get more money in the private sector, uh, working at other jobs now. And it's a difficult, this is a difficult job and it's a difficult area. So, you know, maybe there's some incentives. Maybe, you know, we pay off student loans for those folks that are educated as skilled workers in this area and then commit to be in, in the system for a certain period of time. Uh, you know, there's a whole bunch of different things we can start doing to make people want to go into these fields and, um, and to make them comfortable with going into these fields, knowing they're going to be able to support their families. Right, right. Well, I mean, even uh, my daughter, you know, she's a high school senior and, you know, going through the college application process, uh, you know, one school did recruit her in New Jersey, but I was surprised, like, we never even heard from Rutgers. And that kind of surprised me. I'm thinking, well, that's a state school. You would think that, you know, they would, they would recruit. Um, are we doing enough, you know, at that level? Because, you know, when, when high school seniors are making their decisions, I'm seeing a lot of people, they're going all out of state. Um, and that's one of the easiest ways to keep somebody in state is, hey, we've got great state schools here. And, you know, are they, are they doing enough to, to keep the students in, which gets their education in, then they get their internships here, and then that, that positive domino effect will happen. And we've seen that, that um, we're not doing enough. Uh, we do have great schools, very proud of our universities and colleges. You know, even some of the community colleges that we have are great for kids to get a start uh, at an inexpensive, in an inexpensive manner, and then do their two years and go off to another school, and uh, the acceptance rates are high. But we, we have to do more to keep our kids here because we've learned that once they go out of state to another school, they don't come back. And we can't continue to lose our best and brightest students. That, that, that's certainly for sure. And as a, a parent whose daughter is looking out of state as well as, as in state, yeah, you, uh, you, you want them, uh, definitely want them at least to come back for some of the time. Um, uh, but shifting gears, we, no pun we intended. Have to give them, mm -hmm. We have to give them the reason to come back, right? right? And, and affordability to these, to these young students is a major issue. You know, if they can live out of state and have more discretionary income than they would if they come home, um, you know, that's a huge deterrent. Yeah. So, you know, I don't know where, where you were going to head next, but I could tell you that affordability is a big issue. Well, it, well, it is. It is a huge issue. I was going to head into MVC, but why don't we, now that you brought it up, let, let's go ahead and talk about affordability because it's not just students. It's people who are retiring who can't afford to live here or stay here where, where they grew up and, and they have roots and then they're moving to, you know, places, uh, maybe it's for the weather, but more often than not, it's because the cost of living is less expensive. So what are we doing? What can be done about that? Because Republicans made a lot of gains. Uh, the Democrats still control the legislature and the governor's office. Uh, but we always hear about reforming uh, school uh, funding because that, is, that takes so much of our, uh, our tax dollars go to pay for schools. And people say that system's broken. So how do we make New Jersey more affordable for all living in New Jersey? Well, look, the school funding formula is a big issue. You know, we have to make sure, I mean, that drives property taxes. And if you want to have a direct impact on property taxes, then let's make sure we have a fair funding formula where uh, municipal, where school districts are, uh, you know, are fairly funded. And uh, it's not on the backs of our taxpayers. You know, you see a huge disparity across the state of some districts that receive um, a huge amount of money and others that, that are being cut. A couple of the big districts, uh, school districts in, in my legislative district 
were cut over a million dollars. That's a direct impact on the property taxpayer. So, so that's one aspect. We've got to make sure that our schools are fairly funded. The other thing is we got to start chipping around the edges at some of this stuff. Um, just yesterday, uh, I had a conversation uh, with Senator Sarlo, uh, the, the chairman of the budget committee, about uh, indexing our uh, tax brackets to inflation. And um, I think that bill is going to get heard in committee. I've been pushing that bill for a long time because it has a direct impact on the middle class uh, and, the, and the lower classes. Because as you may get a slight raise, um, maybe you're making $1,000 more. If that additional money pushes you into the next tax bracket, you could end up losing money uh, by getting a raise here in the state of New Jersey. We're one of the few states that doesn't index our tax brackets to inflation, and we really need to consider it. We've got to give people a sense of hope, right? Um, we always hear about the bad things. New Jersey's the most expensive state to live in. Our kids are leaving. People are retiring and moving away. We've got to give our residents a sense of hope to want to stay here. And these small steps give people a sense of hope. If they saw us in Trenton making their lives easier, even in a small sense, uh, it would give them a sense that we're headed in the right direction instead of the direction where most people say is in the wrong direction. And, uh, and I think we need, to, we, need to we need to focus on giving people hope and having them believe that New Jersey is heading in the right direction. One of the steps uh, that you've taken is sponsoring a bill uh, that became early, a law earlier this year that eliminates the MVC, the Motor Vehicle Commission's requirement for a written power of attorney. Now, anybody who's been to MVC uh, knows uh, that that is uh, quite a headache. So tell us how that's actually helping people who are trying to deal with motor vehicles. Well, look, in, early in the pandemic when MVC was shut down, uh, I sent a letter to, to the agency and said, hey, guys, uh, I have an agency in my district in Randolph, and on a good day, it's backed up. And now you've been closed for months. What's your plan to reopen, right? I, I'm a big plan guy. If you can foresee the issues before they occur, you can address them and make them uh, less of a problem when they occur. And uh, unfortunately, they didn't have a plan. And, and we saw that with the huge lines, people sleeping outside of motor vehicle agencies, uh, just completely unacceptable. And so again, we started doing small things, you know, small uh, chip, chipping away at some of the things, allowing people to extend their licenses. Um, you know, again, the power of attorney, allowing folks to um, take driver's tests, get appointments, uh, expand the access through through uh, technology. All of those things help people get through uh, this tough time and the fact that there's such a backlog. So, you know, those are the type of things that people want to see. Has it resolved the problem completely? Probably not. But it does help in getting us to a point where people can 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 get an appointment and go and get the transaction completed in a timely fashion without uh, without having to sit in a lawn chair outside of an agency. And sometimes even longer, just trying to go on to, to get the appointments. Like I said, my daughter uh, recently got her driver's license. I have a 16, uh, soon to be 16 year old son. So we're gonna have to be dealing with that again. So I'll let you know if things are, if things are easier and we hope you come back and, and talk to us again about some of these other uh, pieces of legislation that you're doing that's uh, hopefully trying to make, like, like you said, focus on the positive in New Jersey and what is going in the right direction. Amen. That's what it's all about. Senator Anthony Bucco, thank you so much for taking the time. One of the biggest moves in the state this week, Governor Phil Murphy announced plans to lift the statewide COVID-19 mask requirement in schools. The governor says the dramatic decline in COVID numbers contributed to his decision. He has been facing pressure from parents as well as Republican lawmakers to end the mandate. Here is the announcement I know many of you have been waiting to hear. Because of the dramatic decline in our COVID numbers, effective Monday, March 7th, the statewide school mask mandate will be lifted. Additionally, we will lift the statewide mandate in all childcare settings. 
Later this week, we will extend the public health emergency by 30 days to allow for this mask mandate to continue until then and then be responsibly lifted. As we have with other similar actions, we are announcing this with plenty of advance notice for our schools and childcare settings, for our students and their families, our educators and support staff to determine how this will impact them and to finalize any steps they may need to make in preparation. Masking continues to be an important tool to prevent the spread of COVID and should be used in many circumstances. In the coming weeks, the Department of Health will also be updating, under Judy's leadership, will also be updating its guidance to help school districts make the best decisions as to whether and when masks uh, should be worn. I must thank the overwhelming majority of students, parents, administrators, educators, and support staffers who stood tall as role models ever since our schools returned to in-person instruction by wearing your masks. The state mandate will officially end on March 7th. However, schools can choose to continue requiring students and staff to mask up. We'll tackle this and other political issues on New Jersey politics with Laura Jones every Saturday at 6.30 a.m. and Sunday at 8.30 a.m. And we thank you for joining us here on New Jersey Politics. I'm Laura Jones. We hope to see you back next time.